All right, guys, how you doing? It's Rabia. Hope you're all well. So I'm back from the NAMM show. It was an amazing time. And just before the show started, I released a new single called Arrival. And I got a load of compliments on the mix, which I'm massively grateful for. Really appreciate that. And I also saw there was quite a lot of uh, requests for a mix breakdown. So I figured I would do so because it's awesome that you guys appreciated the, the, the mix. And as you know, if you follow me for a while, it's something that I've been trying to get better at over the years. And this was a fun track to mix because, you know, I don't really do a lot of the kind of lead focused songs. And so this one was cool because, you know, it's focused on the lead guitar and that wants to sit almost like a vocal in a way and, the, and you know the track build around it and everything be you know nice and present and powerful um so i figured that i would take you through a little mix breakdown of the song arrival as a quick caveat as i always say i'm not a professional mixing engineer by any standards i just really love doing it and i love constantly learning about it and getting better so you know there'll be plenty of techniques in here that you if you're experienced at mixing you probably go wouldn't do that or whatever but you know as a lot of you keep saying there aren't really any rules in the world of mixing as long as it sounds good. Um, so that's the ethos that I'm trying to go on. But I want to caveat that. It's also worth saying that this is one of the first songs that I've written and mixed in this new studio uh, with the Genelec system. And I have to say, I absolutely love it. And it's a testament to the sound of the speakers and obviously the room that I'm in that you guys think it sounds good because it was done entirely in this room. So it means that it's translating well to you guys wherever you are or whatever you're listening on. So I'm really happy. So I'm always gonna shout out the quality of Genelec for these sick monitors and subsystem that I've got. Um, and just so you know, in case you were wondering what the models are, I think it's the 8341S tops and the 7360A sub. So it's the, the smart speakers and the both active and the active sub, just in case you were wondering. Anyway, let's crack on with the mix breakdown. Right, so I should have turned into a little bubble somewhere on the screen and you should be able to see my Logic screen. So for those of you who aren't aware, I use Logic as my primary DAW, always have. It's the only thing I've ever learned on. So, you know, that's what I like to use. So this is my arrangement window. Uh, we're only running 33 tracks, including some buses that you can see here that aren't technically tracks of performance, but uh, they're on the arrangement window, but it's not a very big session. What I like to do is color coordinate everything. So you've got an idea, green being drums, sort of red being guitar, then these light blues are usually layers and stuff like that, lead and layers. Purple or pink is always synth. The green is other layers and brown is always bass. It's worth saying that one of the things that I like to do or I have done for a long time now is I automate most things in the mix. It's like, you know, digital versions inside the box of like uh, faders on a desk. As you can see, there's a bunch of automation going on. We've got different automation for like drum rooms, uh, the cross stick section here, parallel compression that gradually builds throughout the song, better crunch guitar. You can see like synth layers, uh, guitar layers, better lead here. So yeah, generally I will like to automate everything f as far as mixes are concerned. Um, it's just what I've learned to do and it works. So this is my drum track. One of the things I always do when it comes to writing and playing really is I'll play in the drum performance on my electric kit if it's this kind of track. Um, and then I usually like, I'll quantize it to say like 80%, 90% so that it's still got a bit of push and pull. And then I will program more difficult stuff that I can't personally play, you know, if the performance, if the, the track and the song require it. But overall, um, you know, it's, it's played on on a kit, so it's got that human approach to like grooves and stuff like that. It's nothing too unrealistic. Um, it's also worth saying that with regards to different microphones here, like the room mics, for example, they won't naturally show up in the arrangement window. You can see all the tracks of the drum kit in here to get them to show up in the arrangement window, you have to right click them and say create track and it will then pop up in the arrangement window allowing you to automate it. I guess the first thing to jump into really is the drum kit 
uh, the way it sounds and how I've got it set up. So let me give you a little example in a chilled section. So that's the drums and the cool thing about them is, you know, these drum libraries that Nolly creates with GGD always just sound fantastic. Um, but one of the things that I've like, I've wanted to do and do do for a while now is I'll mix kits together to get a new sound out of the drums because so many people use these drum libraries now and while they're really great for creating ideas and getting stuff going, if you're going to, you know, release stuff with these libraries, you know, I've heard so many songs and albums that people use these samples on you can Im immediately tell and while you might be able to still tell that it is ggd what i do like to do is set up multiple kits so i've got the p5 kit here this is a great opportunity to use a different kit i usually use invasion but i'm using p5 here um, and then below it i have aggressive rock and what i like to do is blend the snare of aggressive rock and the kick of aggressive rock with any kit that I'm, you know, working with, just because I like the punch and power um, that the snare from um, Aggressive Rock has, you know, and the kick, nice and punchy, and then when you mix it with, that's softer, but it's punchier, it's less subby than the Aggressive Rock one, and the snare, so you've got these two that are kind of similar, but together it creates a really nice tone, um, so let me show you. And the snare on its own. Interestingly, you know, like if I turn off the snare from Invasion, uh, sorry, from Aggressive Rock, you can hear how it's like not as forward. So it just adds a nice little punch there. One thing that is worth pointing out that I discovered whilst I was using this library is you might want to check phase between, uh, you know, the kick drums was the thing that I noticed it was on. Originally I was mixing and I didn't really consider it because I don't really know why, because maybe it's because it's a, a library. I wasn't really considering the fact that, you know, they're not going to be perfectly in phase. And so what I was originally working with was the kick sounding like this. You know, it sounds all right, but then when I flip the phase, I was, getting, I was getting a ton more low end out of it. It was nowhere near as punchy, but not in a bad way. It just you were getting the actual sub content of the kick drum, which is what I was looking for. So make sure you check that if you're going to use multiple kits to get your drum sound, because uh, I found out after delving into the mix and being like, why is this not working for me? And then realized, oh, it's probably because I need to flip the phase. So uh, that's always useful to know. So anyway, that's the, the kit set up. It's two kits, blended kick and snare. And then, you know, if you've watched any of my mix breakdowns before, you'll know the sort of general approach that I like to use. It's actually a lot simpler when using drum libraries because they already sound great and you, do, you have to do very little to them to get them to work in a mix. Um, but general gist, I set all the output I set the outputs of everything on the drum tracks to a master bus and then on that master bus I run an EQ, I run a, a bus compressor and then I run tape saturation. So EQ for giving me a little bit of sub content, a little bit of thickness, as you can see I've boosted everything actually here um, to give me a little more thickness. Uh, let me just show you what it sounds like without.
it's a subtle move, but it sounds good for it. Um, and it's something that I've got used to. You know, it's actually a preset that I've saved on my drum master bus when I'm using drum libraries. What I've done is I've gone to a song that I really like the sound of that I'd used drum libraries on and I'd saved the master bus of that and then I'll tweak it, you know, for the song, but it gives me a great head start, not having to do everything from the ground up. Then you've got a little bit of compression happening and then the tape saturation, which again, it just takes a little bit off the transients of the snare and it gives everything a little bit of a warmer vibe. Um, again, I'll show you what that sounds like. It's a little harsher. Gives it a nice round warmth that I think works really well, especially using drum libraries. I've noticed with the GGD libraries are they are intensely bright. There's a lot of attack, there's a lot of top end that for me personally, it's it's you know, it's too it's not to my taste, it's too much. So what I end up doing is killing a lot of that top end. And from the actual microphones, for example, the snare top, you can see quite clearly here that I'm, you know, I'm cutting out like 4 dB around 11K because there's a lot of stick attack and a lot of crispiness there that I didn't want. So what I'll do is I'll kill it out of the direct, out of the dry mics, and then I might add overall brightness back in at the end because, you know, I want it to be, you know, have the right level of brightness for the mix, but at the same time, it might be too much um, if I leave it inside the dry mics. So, you know, that's something that I like to do. Um, so that's the general gist of the overall dry mics. I'll send them to a master bus. And then what I do is I send them to a parallel compression bus. Um, so as you can see here, there are sends here to bus three. This is bus three. And if you know, if you've watched any of my tracks before, uh, mix breakdowns before, you'll know that I love smash and grab when I'm using uh, the drum libraries. It's just a fantastic compressor that works really well. It's tuned, it's made by GGD, so it's tuned to use with their kits. Uh, and it just sounds fantastic, so I always use it. This is the parallel compression. As you can hear, I'm sending a lot of snare. You can see the sends here. There's a ton of snare top, a little bit of snare bottom, a uh, bit of toms, lots of room, a little bit of kick. And that just blended in um, with the uh, main drum bus, just gives it that punch and presence. It's interesting when you listen to things in isolation it always sounds like overkill um, but you know when it's fighting against all these other instruments in the arrangement you want it to have its place in the mix and still get to hear the quality of the room and stuff like that so often when you solo things they, they sound a little bit intense but about out of control but you know I usually mix into the rest of the arrangement rather than th I'll get the general sound on their own and then I mix into the rest of the arrangement so on the individual channels um, as you can see, it's very straightforward. It's just Pro Q3 and Smash and Grab. And Smash and Grab has, you know, this dial here that lets you set the type of compression. So snare, kick, toms, room, overhead, and parallel. So I'll do that accordingly. And then I EQ accordingly. So this is the room close, as you can hear. Subtle, but it all builds up in the end result without the EQ. Just controlling it a bit, you know, not making things get too out of control. Uh, then we've got room far. That's how this sounds. Again, I'm just EQing the brightness out because for me it's too bright with this is without. You hear the hi-hats are really fighting, they're really sizzly. So that particular EQ process is to get rid of the sizzle from the hi-hats, but still allow that snare drum to cut through. So the snare is way less affected than the cymbal. So again, if I turn off the EQ, I'm going to turn it on. The snare should be less affected than the hi-hats. So again, that's something that I find very useful. And the beauty of Pro Q3 
is of course you can sort of solo and listen in on each band and I find that immensely useful in anything I'm EQing. So here I've gone for the attack of that snare and that's all That's mainly, uh, you know, the very brightness of the snare and the sizzle of the hi-hats. If you haven't tried Pro Q3, FabFilter make some of the best plugins for mixing that I've come across. Pro Q3, by far one of the most valuable plugins that I've got. I absolutely swear by that plugin. So anyway, that's the general process with the drums. Like I said, master bus, bit of EQ and compression, tape saturation, parallel compression bus, I use GGD. Um, and then each individual microphone I EQ and compress to varying degrees depending on the feel and the vibe I'm going for. But that's basically it. Right, so I guess next we'll look at the guitars. Now the guitar, this track is actually quite simple with regards to what's happening behind the lead. Um, it's just, for the most part, this crunch track. <laughs> Um, and that was recorded with my QC, one of my presets. But what I've done here with these two is they're hard, pen left, hard panned left and right, and then I've sent them to bus two, which is my crunch bus. So if I just solo that. So you can see there's quite some quite heavy EQ going on here. I think the reason is because I just placeholded the both the, the tone and the performance really. I was gonna redo it, but then actually it just kind of worked in the mix after I'd messed with it, because I was trying to crack on with the arrangement. So I did a quick bit of EQ or whatever, and I carried on with the arrangement. And then when I came back to listen to it, I'm like, you know what, actually that just works, it fits. But if I take the EQ off, You can hear I've scooped a load of low mid out, uh, a lot of the sort of mid-range 1K kind of vibe, and I've added 9K for a bit of brightness so that it's cutting uh, within the mix when you listen to it. So yeah, that that basically, this this crunch track goes throughout the whole song all the way up until the middle when it breaks down and goes really moody and it's basically just the same vibe throughout the whole thing bit of noise going on there wasn't actually that clean with my uh noise uh management but at the end of the day didn't make a big difference in the, in the final result. Uh, so yeah, that's the EQ. And then I always run my guitars into the Fatso, which is a UAD plugin. I use Universal Audio for my interfaces and for all my plugins, swear by them. I think they're absolutely amazing. So yeah, the, the Fatso I always use on guitars. I think it does something really beautiful to guitars. Both the real life version I know people use on guitars, but in, in the mix process, I always use it. it just sounds great. Uh, so let me show you. It's also worth saying, I just have it tickling the uh, the meter as well. It'll be more so in the palm muted sections because it's more low end content, but. Less controlled. If I, if I play it in the mix without the compression, just makes them tighter and they, they bloom nicely. Um, so yeah, that's the rhythm track there. And then I guess, you know, we'll move on to, what should we move on to next? Let me just show you kind of what's happening in the arrangement outside of the, the main rhythm guitars, drums and bass for this whole beginning bit. So we've got, you've heard the drums, you've heard the rhythm guitar. So let's listen to the bass. So it's 
par muted and picked because I just wanted a tightness about it. It's also worth saying that I have other bass happening. I used my plug-in for all the synth on this track. Um, so for example, this is happening. You might not even be able to hear that. It's a super low 16th note synth part alongside this. For me, with this track as well, with regards to the bass performance and generally everything that's happening in the song, is you're going up in intensity. You start pinned down, everything's palm muted. It opens up a bit for that like second half of the verse. And then for the B section, um, where the, the backing and the melody changes, you open up even more. So for like this section. That compared to compared to that was something really fun to explore with this particular song was just that tension and release and building and building and building. So that's the bass tone. It's a preset that I made on QC and I swear I just got really lucky with it because it's just worked on everything that I've done since I made it. I start, I used it originally, made it for the Totemist 2880 EP, the first Totemist EP, and I modded it a little bit, used it on the second Totemist EP, modded it a bit more, and it's all from the same preset, which is available on Cortex Cloud. It's called Bass EP2 Heavy, I think. And then I've used that on all the Vower stuff, and Rory also uses that preset in the Vower stuff live. We did it for the new Vower record, and it just works. It's just a great, sounding. If you're using Warwick bass, which I do, I use a Corvette and a Thumb. If you're using those basses, it's tuned for that, that sound and it just works for heavy. It's got a great clean. Um, it's really nice and dynamic, but the, the, the high gain sort of bass tone is just disgusting and it just works so well. I really love it. So in terms of what's going on with the bass, um, literally I've just got three channels for my palm muted, my sort of open, and then the heavy stuff at the end. Um, and they're all going into a bus, which you can see here. And what I'm doing on this bus is I'm EQing, I'm sort of a uh, high pass at 30 Hertz. Uh, there's a big dip where there's a bit of like a resonant boom. Um, like if I show you what that sounds like. It's just stuff you don't want in there. 1K6 is great on Warwick's. Dave used to tell me this and when we played live and stuff, 1K6 just has this snarl, so I wanted to boost that. Uh, and that's basically it. That's what's really going on EQ-wise on the bass. And then I'm running it into a distressor. As you can see, these are the settings. Really, I just have it on there to even out the bass. Um, overall because I'm not the best bass player so the dynamics can sometimes be a bit off. Then I run a compressor in Logic, literally just a side chain to the kick drum. This is a really cool technique to allow the kick drum to cut through in the low frequencies of the mix because kicks are super bassy, bass guitars are super bassy. So what I do is I literally just uh, add this compressor, I go up to my side chain option here, I go to inst uh, well, it'll be instrument because it's a software instrument, but if it was all, if it was an actual kick drum microphone, you go audio and then you go to the kick channel. And then what it does is it essentially reacts. Every time that needle goes up and down, that's because the kick drum's being hit. So let me show you. So it's, it's a really useful technique in heavy music to get that kick drum to, cl to k clearly kick through the mix. Um, it works a treat and I've done that for ages and it's just a go-to technique now. And then the final thing that I have is our bass. It's Renaissance bass by Waves. And I literally use this 
because it applies a super uh, like solid, consistent, warm low end and you can change the frequency here and the intensity and all the rest of it. I usually leave it at its default which is 80 hertz and then depending on how much I need of it I'll use this slider so it's minus 11 right now but it, it, it just adds some control. So this is it on, this is it off. It's a wonderful plugin that I've used for years. Dave used to use it, recommendation from him actually. Um, and again, it just works. And that is a chain that I've used for quite a while now on the bass channel, because I use the same preset, usually the same bass, and that's what I end up going for. So that's the bass. Um, now, in terms of other interesting little things that are happening, I've showed you the synth that's happening throughout the track. It's very straightforward. I will sidechain that uh, a compressor to the kick for those as well, so they don't muddy things up because that's even more intensity. And then we've got layers and things. So we've got our intro clean. So this is again a little bit lazy on my on my behalf, um, but basically this was all one track, and rather than double tracking it, I used the doubler. Um, but what I wanted to do is make the very start mono. So if I open up the plugin, you can see it's off. The double is the double is off, and I've EQ'd it so that it's got like a nice filtery kind of thing going on. And then when the track kicks in, I've got the doubler on, on my plugin, and I'm using way less intense EQ here, just taking out 4K so it's not too harsh. Um, but the cool thing with that is that the doubler makes suddenly everything sound really nice and wide, like double tracked. And because, <laughs> because I was just trying to get the song done, I didn't, couldn't be bothered to double track it, so I just, I just did that which is kind of lazy, I'm not going to lie, but the effect worked, so it should widen out when it kicks in. A cheeky little trick, but it had the desired effect. I find that when I'm writing and arranging and producing and then mixing, a lot of these ideas just come from how I imagine it should sound. Like, I'm like, oh, that would be cool if it's like, you know, mono and like really like narrow EQ and then it widens out and feels double tracked so that you get this nice big we're in the song effect. So I was just trying to create what I kind of had in my head for the sound. And I think that's a big part of producing music um, outside of writing it and arranging it and stuff. It's the producing element of it that I think uh, is where the most creativity happens. And I really love that. Really love like imagining how it should sound and then trying to create that through mixing. So anyway, those are the cleans. Then let me show you what's going on layers wise. So, oh, that's not the layers. So for the start of the song, we only really have the lead coming in. So what's really only going on there is I've got EQ, I'm using the Fatso again because I love it, and then I'm using Precision K Stereo, which is a universal audio plugin that just, I put it on the lead vocal setting because it does something nice to the stereo imaging of the guitar. Um, because I recorded this on um, the QC, it was a stereo track, you know, as in I had uh, left and right channel so it can work really nicely. So I just put the lead vocal preset on and it just did something really nice. So let me show what it's like on and off, so. Just kind of places it nicely in the mix. And then I've got a 
send happening here which is going to this bus and that's just got some reverb capital chambers because it's incredible reverb from universal audio uh, and then i'm eqing it a little bit just to get rid of some of the intensity but it was for extra vibe throughout the song so if i turn off the send It's just a little bit more vibe for it to swim in. So those are the core instruments. And then what happens is I really wanted to follow the lead line with a synth. And because my plugin has a synth that I get to play guitar on, I figured I'd just do it with that. So this is the lead line. This is the thing that I love about my plugin. I'm not trying to plug the plugin too much, but. That's the same lick, the same lead line. I found a sound that worked, so I can show you. I've got the 16th note arp on. It's not doing any octaves, it's just one octave, 16th notes with that particular sound on, and it just added movement to the lead line, and it gave it a whimsical feel, and I just, Yes, it, for me to learn that on keyboard would have taken forever. I probably wouldn't have been able to do it. It would have taken too long and I'd have got bored. But the fact that I can just load up the plugin, get a sound that fits with the guitar, play it on the guitar, and then have it back it up, and it's, it sound really cool. I was just, I just, it blows me away, so. one of those things that's subtle it's just in the when you listen on headphones especially it's just in the mix a little bit and you it just adds to the effect of everything um so yeah and then what we've also got going on when that top line comes in is a chimey guitar part Again, more texture. Hannah called it um, cream cheese. She said there needs to be more, when I showed her the demo of this, she said there needs to be more cream cheese in this arrangement. And what she means is all those layers that just, you, they're not super audible, but when you, when you focus in, you can hear them. But what they do is they just add this bed of thickness to the whole arrangement, the depth, <laughs> the cream cheese. And then the same thing, we've got a pad happening here. It's so subtle, but it really adds up in the final arrangement when you've got it there. Again, it, it, I use it on this section as well. And again, if I take it out, It's just, it's just adding depth. That's less of a mix thing and more of a producing thing. Again, I EQ out just the, the stuff that gets in the way, like the thick low mid or like if it's too much and everything's getting a bit honky in the mid range. You're just trying to smooth everything out, get everything sitting nicely. And everything has its place in the mix, so it's just about carving that out uh, to work with all the other layers and stuff. Anyway, that's probably 
the main bulk of the of the of the mix so far. And we move into the middle section. There's not a lot happening here. So take away the lead guitar. We've got 16th note synth bass. And the only other thing that I wanted to do, because it was, I want it to be pulled back. I want it to be really focused in on what the lead guitar is doing. The only other thing that's happening in this section is the this synth sound. Super subtle in the mix. It's so subtle. That was my plugin, but I bounced it to audio, sometimes to clear up your CPU and allow a little bit more out of it. If you're tracking at the same time as working, um, you need a low buffer size so that you can track without latency. So what I end up doing is I'll track an idea in using my plugin, then I will bounce it in place. Bouncing in place is really useful because it frees up CPU so the plugin's not having to work. Um, so like my intro clean, I've got the plugin active. If I want to bounce this in place and commit, and commit the sound, I'd right click, bounce in place. It would process it and create an audio track like you see here. Um, and then it would mute that track so it would become inactive and that just frees up CPU. It's a really nice method of making sure you can keep working and tracking uh, without compromising latency. This middle section is all about the guitar, so. That's the same preset as the section before, but with the Vemuram pedal on QC turned off. So it's the same preset all the way through. And the idea with this section was to go super close. Like there's a lot of reverb on there, but like it's just about that lead guitar. So it gets nice and tense. And it's a, it's a kind of reharmonization of the top line in the first half. So uh, this section here. Same idea, but a little bit more haunting. I just figured that that was cool. Uh, and I like the way that it's referencing the same top line melody, but it's kind of gone a bit weird about it. So now we're moving on to the finale of the song, the back end. This, is, this bit came way later than the first half of the song when I knew I wanted to use this track for the launch of the guitars. And this was a half finished idea, like half baked at the time. I was like, I need to finish it. And it absolutely needs to go really disgustingly heavy. So. So the death guitars was the first thing. This is really cool. So what I've actually done here, it's two instances of my plugin and I've transposed the whole thing down an octave. So this is what it would sound like with the octave, with the transposition off. You might notice it's really thin and scratchy and that's because when you down tune that much, there's so much more low end going on that you need to carve it out. So that's what it sounds like without it. Super useful feature. In terms of what the death guitar are doing, they're going into a bus, as you can see, heavy. Same thing here, I've got EQ and I've got Fatso. That's all I really use. Simple, but it effect very effective. And that's to give me this. On their own, they can sound a little bit fizzy and harsh, but you know, also, you know, it's the kind of heavy tone, didn't want to go for like archetypal, no pun intended, gent, you know, like it's not really my vibe, but I wanted like sludgy almost and my plugin, it 
isn't a gent plugin, but it's really good for high gain sludge. It's it's tight, but you know, in this instance, I wanted that. And as I said, it's a bit fizzy in isolation, but when you put it in the mix. So it sits nicely in the mix. It's worth saying that, you know, um, don't be afraid of certain things that jump out in isolation. Like it's always good to reference it in the mix with everything else because, you know, you might carve out a lot of that high stuff and think that sounds great when you're soloing it. You put it in the mix and you might move on and go like, why isn't this hitting hard enough? Why aren't I getting the kind of intensity that I want? It's probably because you've taken away too much. There's a fine balance I've learned over the years is like, you know, you want to carve stuff out, but not go too far that it's just, it's not working for you anymore. Anyway, so that's the death guitar. I'm running alongside that, a, a riff synth again from my plugin, uh, just following that riff. And as, you, as, you, as you've noticed there, I wanted to leave in that top end so, because it's it likes an intense sound. I wanted that section to really be like, oh, like a wall of intensity. Um, again, the beauty of using the plugin is that I can play the riff in and then I've got this super consistent uh, low end that just supports and it adds weight to the whole section, even though I've got bass happening as well. Like... You know, so there's a lot of low end happening, but the synth is such a controlled low end, it's so it's so solid that it just adds more weight, you know? So before we get into the next section, just in terms of what's happened on the drums, I've boosted the parallel compression. Uh, as you can see throughout the song, it's slowly getting higher and higher until we hit this section. And then as it kicks in, I've put parallel compression at unity with the drum master so that it's really punching through. Just so that you, know, you can see how these things work in terms of dynamics throughout the song. The other thing to point out is I've got this gaze channel, which is just fast picked kind of And it adds epicness. That is, it's a really easy way to get epicness out of these sections. Again, if I play it without it on. It's a super useful approach to, you know, guitar layering. I really love it. Um, again, pulling out loads of low end, some mid range and stuff. Uh, I've got Empirical Labs Fatso on it again. I use that, you can tell I like it. And then I'm actually using the K Stereo plugin from Universal Audio with Add Stereo Width preset. So that's just pushing it out to the side even more, which is really useful because it cleans up the middle so that I get to focus on the lead guitar, which is this. So we've got this happening now. So I'm using an octave lower just to add that kind of vocal feel to this part. And then it drops out uh, for the shreddy bit. And so this section, after we've done the heavy stuff, is the re-entry of the melody, the top line melody from the first part. And to give it more weight once again, I wanted to keep the synth going. So I've used my sort of favorite synth preset from the plugin, which is. It just sounds so epic when I mean, it's in the mix as well, like. If 
I take it out, it just doesn't have the same weight. So that's it. I mean, you know, basically I was just soloing stuff so that you could hear it's a continuation of what you heard before. So like that top line melody has an octave lower. Uh, the synth is still going. The shoegaze section is still going. That's actually the last thing you hear on the song. Um, the death guitars are still going. Everything's still going in the same way. You know, the the far room of the drum is boosted. The, you know, the parallel compression's boosted. Everything's just kind of at the climax of the song. So, you know, it wants to sound really thick and epic and, you know, I know I'm constantly sounds like I'm plugging my plugin and it's not necessarily uh, unintentional, but the way it allows me to create these deep, expansive arrangements fairly easily and simply with just adding, you know, that synth, the reverbs, the, the transposition of the guitar, you know, like it, it allows me to do so much, you know, like the shoegazery thing with the, the, the delay guitar, you know, like it allows me to do so much. It's just made making music easier for me. And I guess that's the beauty of the, the product, you know, and the fact that we've, we, we managed to nail it for me personally, the amount that it can do for me with regards to the music I like to make is just, it's endless as far as I'm concerned. It just made everything so much more enjoyable. So, you know, anyone that's got it, I hope, you know, you're, you're getting something from this when you, you realize just how much you can actually do. Most of this, the lead guitar was done with QC, the bass was done with QC, but everything else was done with the plug-in, the cleans, the heavies, the synths, the layering, everything. It's just so easy and enjoyable to use. So that's the arrangement. That's everything. I hope it's made sense. To summarize, it's just EQ and compression on most things, carving things out in the right areas so that it all fits together in the final mix. Drums, everything goes to a master drum bus. I then send everything to a parallel compression bus, blend it in as and when I need it. And the most important thing is automation throughout the song. As you can see here, the shoegazery section has got a ton of automation. Like when I want the shred, shred part to happen, so this bit, This has come right down because it was getting in the way. So if I turn off the automation and you can hear it all at one level for that section. You know, it, take, it takes focus away from that lead guitar because it doesn't sound wrong, but it just takes focus away. So if I play it again with it, It's so all these subtleties, all these subtle moves within uh, automation that the final result, you're not meant to notice it, but it allows the listener to focus in in different areas of the mix and different things that I want them to focus in on. So yeah, automation is super important when you're mixing or you know, if you've got a real desk and you can write it in with faders, then, then there you go. Right, the last thing that's really important to talk about after we've done all our buses, our automation, our general work is the master bus. Now. I do something that I know guys like Nolly do and a bunch of others do, which is the top-down mixing approach, which is where I load up my master bus and then I mix into it because it's how I want it to sound. You know, it has the overall character to the mix. Um, and I've used the same one for so long now that I made it ages ago. And I don't even know if it's right, the order of the plugins, I don't know if it's right. But when I load it onto my arrangements, it just works. And I've learned to mix into this master bus. I've slightly modified it and I'm gonna keep it modified going forward. But the mainstays have always been Shadow Hills compressor, which starts me off. And then I run it into another compressor, which is the SSL, which is barely doing anything. It's barely doing anything, but it just adds a certain color. 
that runs into the back's EQ, which really you should do EQ before compression, but I've done it the other way around and it's probably wrong. But in any case, I don't want to change it because it just works. As you can see, I'm boosting, what is that, 64 hertz? Or is that 84? Yes, yeah, 84 a little bit. And I've got 7.1K boosted quite a bit. And that adds my kind of smiley face EQ to the mix. Like if I play it. It's adding that sort of effect of the smiley face EQ that I like. That runs into uh, the API 550B. And again, I'm boosting 2.5K by 2dB. This is quite interesting. This is a Waves uh, plugin. And I could use the same EQ in Universal Audio, but this one has a certain sound and it's probably because it's not as accurate as the real thing, but it just works. Um, again, boosting 2K, boosting 5K. Uh, I'm actually taking out 30 hertz. So it's funny, when I turn this off, it makes quite a big difference. What I might do, oh, you can hear quite a big difference there. What I might do is change it out, you know, when I'm not in a rush or need to just get something going. I might change it out for a different one. But it's very influential to the overall sound. Then I'm running into this Studer A800 um, tape saturation, tape um, emulator. Again, what this does is it adds, you know, the more you turn up the input, the more things squash together, uh, but it's also attenuation because, you know, I haven't fully mastered how to keep everything quiet uh, in a mix so that it isn't clipping my master bus. Um, so what I use this for outside of the color is to actually attenuate the whole mix so that I can then hit a limiter at a good level. Uh, it's something I need to get better at, but you know, it works for now. <laughs> but let me show you what it sounds like on and off. Again, it adds warmth, it adds thickness, um, and overall it just sounds great, so I like to use that. Then I've got a Master EQ on Pro Q3, linear phase set up, and I'm doing mid and side. This is a trick that I learned from Misha on his mix breakdown ages ago, and I've kind of just kept it because it, it I think it works. Um, so what I'm doing is, as you can see here, I've got a, a high pass and then it's sending everything. Uh, what I'm trying to do is carve out the stereo image so that everything sounds nice. It's not too lumpy anywhere. So let me show you. So that stuff, anything below that is going to the sides. And that's, that's the mid. So I've got sides and mid, and that I'm pulling out uh, one and a half dB roughly of 750 hertz. I've then got 2K and 4K, which I'm doing across the whole mix, as you can see. So this green line and this blue line are mids and sides, whereas this orange line uh, is an overall EQ, and I'm pulling those frequencies out because I felt that they were a bit of a nuisance in the mix. And then I'm boosting the high end as well. Um, then I run it into Soothe, by OX Sound, 100% recommend this plugin. I use it on overheads, you can use it on guitar, you can use it on anything. But what it does is it uses AI, I believe, to analyze your mix and it essentially smoothens, soothes things out. So. So all this stuff, it's it's sort of tidying it up for me. Same with the low end. And I only have it set on relatively low, as you can see, it's not much going on there, but it, it is mega useful. It really works. Now, a new plugin that I'm new to recently is Gulfos Master. This thing, I see Nolly use it, I've seen some other people use it, and I have to say, I took a punt on it, I bought it, and it's really good. I don't fully know how to use it yet, <laughs> 
but it has a recover uh, parameter and a tame parameter, and those are the things that I'm currently using. I'm also brightening the mix a tiny bit. But this is one of those plugins that I, f I don't fully understand what it does other than know it's EQ related. And you have three different versions of it. This is the master version. And it's the kind of thing that you put on, you mess with it a little bit. You're like, what's it even doing? You turn it off and you're like, oh, no, that needs to go back on right now. So if I turn it, if I have it on and then turn it off, I feel like it's similar to what Soothe does in a way is that it's analyzing all these areas in your mix and it's it's just sorting it out. It's just like helping you to get a more balanced effect across your mix and it, and it really works. So that's the mainstay now. And now my limiting, I use JST clip and then, and then what I do is I pull back the trim by one and a half dB. Uh, I have it on two times clipping and just barely tickling it. And this is a trick that I learned from Mark Roberts. So I use that and then it goes, and then I send it an, into another limiter, which is Pro L2. And then I've got this on uh, a natural loudness preset that I've tweaked a little bit. But let me show you what happens. So this is without Pro L2. I mean, it just opens right up and then the other way around. So this is without JST. By pulling the trim down, it's tamed everything a little bit before it hits Pro L2, but the two in combination um, have a really nice effect. And it doesn't sound over the top, you know, like when it hits, everything, you know, punches in it and it like swells up, you know, but not in a over compressed kind of way. I mean, it is, you know, compression and EQ in modern heavy music is just like the thing, compression especially, you know, we've, we know this. But I am a student of mixing and doing all this and I'm very late to the party and I don't fully understand the rights and wrongs, the do's and the don'ts. But as long as it doesn't sound too pumping to me, I like the effect the compression has. I like the effect of everything sounding intense when it's meant to. But I also like trying to achieve dynamics and I'm learning this on my own. You know, I haven't had any lessons in this. So it's like when I get from this part of the song, I want it to feel like it's leveling up in terms of its dynamic and intensity. That's basically it. That's the master bus. I always mix into it. I've added some new uh, plugins there, but that pretty much covers this song. And I know I've, it's probably been quite a long video. I have John try and cut it down as much as possible. But you know, particularly with this one, there was a lot more going on than I guess I expected, even though there are only you know, 30 tracks or whatever compared to some arrangements I've done. There was a lot more to do to make things sit nicely because there's less happening. So you want things to feel like there's a point to them, that they sit in the right place, that everything works how you want it to. So there you go. There is a look at the arrival mix uh, and song breakdown. I hope you've enjoyed it. I hope you found some useful tips in there. Again, just to reiterate things that I find important. I think it's good to group tracks together once you've got your performances like your rhythm guitars into one bus you know, your layers into another bus, provided they're of a similar vibe, your drums into a master bus, then your drums into a parallel compression bus. Compression and EQ where necessary, you know, overall compression and EQ, it's just a lot of that. And then imaging, stereo imaging and stuff that I like to use for like lead layers or, or layers in general, atmospheric stuff. It's good if you can use some sort of imaging plugin or something like that, or panning of some sort to place them in different areas so it's not just hard panned or in the center and it's clogging things up. And this is about taming things you don't like the sound of, like whistly frequencies in cymbals and guitars, and then just trying to get things to dynamically build. Use automation where you can. Use automation so that you start things out at a certain level and they build and drop in the right places for you. As I said, I'm not a professional mixing engineer. I'm just trying to work out what I'm doing at the same time as sharing it with you. But I really hope you've enjoyed this video. I hope it's been useful to you. Um, thank you for the kind words on the song and also wanting a mix breakdown and a song breakdown. 
So for those of you who asked, I hope this is satisfactory. Thank you for watching this video. If you haven't heard the song, I'll put a link, a link in the description box. You can find all my music online. You can stream it on all platforms, including Bandcamp. Thank you all for your support. Uh, I've been Rabia and I'll see you all very soon. Thank you.